Good morning. We got a good one for you today, April 20th. Uh, and Elon Musk did not report earnings on April 20th. Uh, maybe things not not so good for him. So we'll get to that uh, for sure. They did report earnings last night. Um, but we're going to actually start out with Tom because I saw a headline this morning and the three-month T-bill is at a 22-year high. Uh, that's, so last, that's, that's pretty crazy, 531. Last time it was this high, Mo, Mo was barely crawling, if crawling at all. So shout out to Mo. Just set, setting landmarks, lifetime landmarks here on your uh, on your three month uh, T bill, but in fact, that's not even the high point on the curve. Uh, so the the three month is now above five percent, but the actual high point is four months, two days uh, is the most value you can get on a uh, T bill right now. The uh, August twenty second, two thousand twenty three issues are trading at five twenty, uh, so you can lock in for four months at an annualized rate of five twenty. Uh, well, four months and two days. So, uh, I mean, we're just continuing to see pressure on the front end. I think this rate hike is, if not written in pen, it's written in erasable pen. I don't know if they still have those, but they had them when I was a kid when people were learning to do uh, cursive. And implicitly now, I guess we're looking at probably another rate hike. It definitely seems like. I mean, Bullard, you know, we give Bullard a lot of grief, but sure. but but he's definitely been more directionally correct than the rest of the entire Federal Reserve. Yeah, so functionally, we're looking at 1.2 estimated right now. So he almost spoke it into existence. And, you know, we've been in this cycle. This is probably the fourth or fifth time where it's the Fed's going to pivot, the Fed's going to pivot, the Fed's going to pivot, and then they don't. And then everyone gets excited. Bonds trade up. Stock market goes up. Then it slowly comes back into view that maybe the Fed's not going to slow down. And the stock market starts to falter a little bit. Bonds start to falter a little bit. Uh, it started call it a year ago last year, uh, and we've done this cycle three, four times now. So again, when it comes to risk management, we've got to be cognizant that all of the damage is to higher rates. And so we need to position ourselves where we can make as much money on bonds as possible, as much money on stocks as possible, but be aware that rising rates could continue. And that's where there's a lot more downside than the upside. If they cut rates, that's awesome. Everything's great. If not, you know, we need to be diligent there. And so, you know, that's the path we're on again. We've stayed on that path probably more than than most in the market. And I mean, here we are again. So so the question is, and we do have eight pages of notes that I'm sure we're not going to get to today. Um, so if you would like a copy of the notes, uh, one time only offer, we we can send you the note, notes for today. Um, but I think it begs the question, I think this is relevant, uh, Mo and Tom, if we're at another level of hawkishness from the Federal Reserve, and we're seeing potentially weakening data, and we'll talk a lot about these earnings results today. Um, they're beating a lot of okay, these company beating estimates, but over an extraordinarily low bar. If we're seeing that in connection with higher rates, how on earth is the market not at a new cycle low? And, and let, let alone as high as it is today. I think. Uh... We took a lot of the downside on the front end. I think that the fear of rising rates is less now than it was, if that makes sense. I mean, we managed to get you know, 18 rate hikes. The market obviously was down a lot last year, but I think a lot of that, like it's like when you rip off the Band-Aid, it hurts a lot at first. And then if you rip off another Band-Aid right after, it's probably not going to be nearly as traumatic. And I think you know, we're talking two, three rate hikes. We're not talking 18. So each incremental rate hike is going to be functionally less effective on stock valuations, I think, uh, you know, because the difference between zero and four is a lot more than the difference between four and five. What are you, what, what are your thoughts, Mo? Are, are you seeing some green shoots out there in, in pockets or um, what, are, what are your what is your view on that same question? It's tricky because I think in regards to the market, I and in fact, we discussed this in the PM meetings. I, I mean, if you I've just been looking at the historical data and my concern is that historically, the markets have not done well at all following a Fed, a Fed pivot for a significant amount of time. So that's kind of like the bear in me right now. It's looking at that and kind of getting nervous. Twos and tens are still reversed. And I know they've been, you know, inverse for, for quite a while now, but I, I, I still think that's eight for eight. So there's a couple of things that are sticking out to me. I'm really interested to see what this NFP report comes out in a few weeks. But at the same time, I mean, these estimates for these earnings reports are terribly low. 
So, I mean, these companies have easy beats across the board and, uh, you know, that could result in a melt up in the markets. Yeah. And, up. and I think there's a lot of short interest right now as well. I, I very much agree. I think that's an excellent point. I think that the, the short interest is is very high right now. And I think that, um, you know, it goes to show, and again, we'll talk a little bit about this, but Tesla had just a terrible quarter in terms of uh, free cash yep. and uh, actual deliveries. Um, so, and yet, the, and stock couldn't go down below 3% for a while. I think it's down seven or 8% yeah. right now, but it took a while. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very curious. And, and just quickly on that non-farm payroll report that we're going to get in a couple, in a few weeks, uh, the estimate on that right now, I think it's 26,000, 26, not, not with that's double digits. Uh, yeah. we've been, we haven't seen a print that bad since I think the pandemic, um, and you know it does bode the risk that we could easily pose the risk that we could easily be negative in the month of april and we talked a little bit about that yesterday but let's jump into it a little bit um i'll start off with themes and then i'll go to you on the housing yep. front mo um but in general the big themes from the earnings reports is that auto is okay um but tesla is quite bad um and i would say there's a little bit of a distinction between tesla and the rest of the auto space the issue for the rest of the auto space is that tesla is really beginning this price war um and i think that that is having a negative reverberation to some of the other autos so you're seeing gm down three percent and, and things like that this morning but um we'll talk a little bit about that semiconductors uh seem like they took the hit early in terms of really getting blasted, uh, but they've really rationalized the space and, and seem that we might we might return to growth there sooner than the rest of the market. Um, retail is definitely slowing, but the credit quality is holding up okay as American Express and Discover uh, Discover Financial uh, Discover Card uh, showed last night. Um, and housing is actually picking up a little bit of steam here. Again, estimates very low, but. Um, certainly jumping over that bar. So Mo, talk to us about DR Horton. What I think I think they might be the largest home builder yeah. in terms of volume. So yeah, they, they they push a lot. Um so right off the right off the bat, they had I mean, considering low estimates, I still think they reported decently well numbers. I mean they, they blew their EPS out of the water so with top line revenue. I, the thing that stood out the most to their earnings report was the orders came back significantly higher. They're at twenty three thousand versus the estimate about 19.6 so i mean that's that's a pretty good result i think with housing and the home builders in general right now um we're, we're starting to see that growth this is not the first quarter um last quarter they reported really well as well and that whole sector is starting to pick up steam so i, I like where the housing supply is going and as a result i think you'll see lower home values um so i think the housing market is starting to look a little bit better and, yeah. and, and the forecast looks a lot better as and, well. it, and it seems like they're buying they're building smaller homes yeah. they're, they're building those homes that are going to be more affordable um quicker to put up yep and and it's and it's not as much um prices coming and we talked a lot about this at the turn of the year it, prices don't necessarily have to come down on a like for like basis for mm -hmm. homes because we have a supply issue yep. what needs to happen is we need more supply of cheaper homes yeah um, and I think that DR Horton's leaning into that and, and you're definitely seeing the results there. Um, and certainly the stabilization and mortgage rates have helped yeah. the cancellation rates come down. I was 32% in Q3 of last year, and that's all the way down to 18% now. So, um, so good news there. Yeah. I think housing is in a much better spot than it used to be. Um, banks, uh, we did get news, uh, for those of you who are interested, more local truest did report earnings, uh, truest deposits were down 5% year over year, which is not great actually um they were down two percent quarter over quarter um so definitely saw some deposit outflow there they had to increase deposit rates by 64 basis points which is on the higher end of some of these banks i've been following so uh truest not executing potentially as well you're seeing a little bit more flighty deposits which was a little bit surprising given the strength we've seen elsewhere in more southeast banks we do have regions financial reporting on friday um, on the credit card side, uh, we're seeing credit normalize a little bit, um, but certainly uh, devoid of that shock that we had last quarter. Last quarter, Discover uh, guided for net charge offs to be up quite significantly, um, but tighten that guidance range up a little bit this time around. Um, and, and you're seeing delinquencies uh, 
moderate uh, a bit. So we're seeing we're seeing pretty good news on the credit card front. American Express was a bit disappointing. I think it, a lot of it had to do with reserves. They did spend a little bit more on marketing, trying to juice their card sales at the beginning of the year, and they and they did do that. They had a 3.4 million new cards. Uh, that's up from 3 million in last quarter. So they continue to grow, especially with millennials and Gen Z. But uh, boomers were actually the ones who had the biggest acceleration. They were only up 6% on year year basis in terms of uh, actual transactions. And they were up 8% uh, last quarter. Millennials and Gen Z volume was up 28% for American Express. Um, Tom, private equity. This has been the bane of our existence for the better half of two and a half years because it's just been a license to print money but it seems like the tide is flowing out a little bit there uh, blackstone is up a little bit this morning um but you're seeing net inflows begin to slow um they do have a lot of dry powder but 193 billion dollars of dry powder so a lot can be deployed uh, but this is basically the best private equity company out there and even they see net inflows under underperforming what they thought they would be. Yeah, I think one of the unintended consequences of lower interest rates is tons and tons of money flew into private equity. You know, we've been on the circuit where we talk about, you know, buying bonds at, at conferences and, you know, inevitably you're followed up behind by somebody in private equity who's like, you know, why would you, why would you buy a bond paying 3% when you can turn around and you can get into this completely locked up private equity deal where we'll pay you 9% over the next 10 years. Uh, but you've got no liquidity. You've got, you know, pretty questionable assets that are being bought and at valuations that were also pretty questionable and definitely driven up by the lower interest rate. And so you're seeing those deals, you know, quickly becoming uh, not so attractive. You know, if you're like, man, I'm going to lock in for five years at 5%, like that's awesome. You know, but now you know, that same money is chasing after 10, 12%, 15%, because you can turn around and buy a treasury, you can get back in four months at 5%. Uh, and so I think that it's not an area that has yet to blow up, but I think that there's a lot of potential for blow ups. Uh, you know, you saw earlier this year, was it the, it was, I think it was Blackstone, their real estate fund had a run on it. People are trying to get their money out. There's only so much liquidity they can provide. They've got to actually sell physical assets to get out of those positions. Uh, you know, and so they basically said, hey, we, you can't take money out of this fund for some period of time because we're just having too many people trying to withdraw and we can't sell the assets fast enough. And not only that, the more urgency we have to sell the assets, the worse the performance is for everyone in that fund. And while that hasn't quite cracked, I think that's something that is going to crack. And it hasn't cracked for Blackstone. It hasn't cracked but, for but, yeah. but, but Blackstone has perpetual funds and it has, because it's the biggest player in the industry, it has a ton of power over its and over its limited partners yep. in terms of setting lockups yep. like like in uh Blackstone B read so uh you're you're not seeing that much at Blackstone right now but i also think Blackstone is probably just waiting with that cash waiting for rates to go and then deploy it but i think there are a lot if you're not if you're in a, in single deals or if you're in single funds and not perpetual funds um and I, I don't think perpetual funds are good because I think that over time the returns are, you know, revert to the mean. Right. Um, but uh, you know, if you're if you're in single deals, like you you are at the behest. Uh, you your 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 private equity sponsor is just much weaker, and uh, won't won't have that staying power that a Blackstone might have. Yeah. So they're they're in a good position because they're at the top of the heap and they've got dry powder. But you know, the lower you get on the private equity scale. You know, the smaller the deal, the smaller the partner. I mean, you could be in a position where you're getting to lose a lot of money. And Blackstone ultimately could be a winner there uh, because they've got the scale. But, you know, we're starting to see the erosion there. I think it's going to accelerate here very quickly. It's already starting. I mean, they're, and the problem is they have no deal flow over their PE right now. None at all. I mean, when I was interviewing at a firm that shall not be named, I mean, they flat out said, listen, uh, we're not hiring right now because we haven't had a deal in six months. Wow. So it's that was four months, five months ago. So much of the game is just moving uh, an investment. I mean, we've seen it with what was that company that just went bankrupt? It starts with a D. Um, what is, what's the industry? Retail. It's DS, not DSW. Oh, David's Bridal. David's Bridal just oh, went yeah. bankrupt. And it, that hopped from private equity to private equity to private equity. Um, 
And it, it, I mean, I was looking up David's bridal bankruptcy and it goes bankrupt on the dot, like every three and a half years. Yeah. They just lever it up. They trade it off somebody else. They can't afford to keep it. It goes bankrupt. Yeah. Somebody buys it for cheap, levers up. Yeah. I mean, it's the same. It's like buying art. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll hit, I'll hit a few of these quickly. Uh, Philip Morris uh, came in broadly as expected. I, I was hoping for a little bit more. They did take their guidance down for the year. Uh, that was all because of currency, though. Um, I was hoping to see a little bit more upside, frankly, on on the Philip Morris. Uh, they still have really good growth in uh, industry. I mean, they've gotten growth seven to nine percent this year um, in an industry that that's in decline. Thirty five percent of their business is now net, uh, non combustible, whether that's heated tobacco units or the Zen nicotine pouches. So that I, I think they're making the right strategic moves, but um, definitely hit hit by currency. And that share is probably going to go up from 35%. Yeah. I mean, it's already up from like 33% yeah. in, in a quarter. Um, Union Pacific reported earnings, big railroad. Uh, they really couldn't have been worse than they've been for the last three quarters. So uh, they, they improved and, and despite some tough weather too. So I was pleased to see that quarter from Union Pacific. I would hope that stock would be up, but ultimately that's going to be a macro. They they are firing their CEO, but that's going to take place over the period of nine months. So uh, keep an eye on that. They downgraded their outlook for coal and downgraded their outlook for domestic intermodal. Um, so, you know, something to watch there. I do, I do think forestry products might, which which they have a negative outlook on. They There could be some upside there, uh, given what we're seeing in housing. Yeah. Um, and then in semiconductors, uh, Taiwan Semi was the big report. Uh, they expect Q2 to be uh, quite bad. Uh, the big numbers on Taiwan Semi are that uh, they took down their guidance for uh, wafer starts and, and, and chip sales for the year. Um, but they actually reiterated their capital expenditure forecast because they are seeing enough growth in artificial intelligence uh, that it warrants investment. So uh, that's something to watch. There, there was there were reports just a couple of days ago that Taiwan Semi was going to cut CapEx budget again, and that did not happen. Uh, and then IBM reported as well and actually says that North America has the most skittishness right now. Europe is actually outperforming the ex expectation. Which is odd. Yeah, because because basically Europe is saying we need to invest in technology because that's cheaper than workers. <laughs> so right. so that's what I that's what they're seeing in Europe. And then Asia is quite strong for IBM. So um I think that actually bodes fairly well. Cisco had a bad day yesterday, but I'm hopeful that uh this has a positive halo effect for them. So with that, um Mo just uh, want to couple quick notes on AT&T is down yeah. 5%. And really, we've been investing in T-Mobile. So maybe just the read for T-Mobile and, and what you expect on that. And then Tom, I'll go to you on Tesla. Yeah. So with AT&T, I think it, it was kind of a disappointing quarter. Um, specifically, really just the post-based net ads came in a lot lower than I think anyone was expecting. Um, it came in four, uh, 542 versus the analyst estimate of 637. Um, and then Secondly, I think the other concerning part about it was the churn rate went up about five bips. So uh, that's kind of something to keep an eye on. They've historically been able to keep that churn rate relatively low compared to the rest of the sector. But and I'm, I'm thinking about it from a T-Mobile perspective um, in terms of the churn rates, where do their customers go? And I can probably guess that it may have been Comcast or T-Mobile. So we'll see. Um, in news to T-Mobile, um, they did announce today that they have an uncarrier move at noon. Um, and they said they're going to smoke the competition. So all eyes out for T-Mobile at noon today, see what they're going to come up with. And I'm I'm looking for any any way to get rid of my cable bill because and it just keeps going up. And my Verizon bill, I would like to get rid of too. So I mean, they're starting to build a good little bundle package over there. So keep an eye on it. All right, uh, Tom Tesla. Uh, they actually almost met expectations on earnings. Uh, but they missed on revenue. Uh, they missed on gross margin. They they said twenty percent was the floor on gross margin in at the in January, and they're already below that. Uh, so that's quite bad. They're down nine hundred basis points on a year over year basis, and free cash flow is barely positive. Um, underperformed. That I mean, the Street was looking for three billion in free cash flow. They came in with four hundred million. Um, so essentially, they they have a ton of cash locked up in inventory right now because production exceeds deliveries. They say that they're going to keep pushing production because there's demand there, but at the same time, they're cutting price. 
And then they argue that that makes sense because they're going to make it up on the back end with sales of all autonomy solutions. And basically what they're saying is if you buy a Tesla, get ready, because that's not the biggest payment you'll make in your ownership of, the, of a Tesla. Yeah, I think the what they're trying to do sounds a lot like the iPhone transitioning into the Apple ecosystem, right? They want to sell you a Tesla, get you hyped about Tesla, the brand, and then you know, you got to have the home charger, then you've got to have the power wall, then maybe you'll get the solar roof. And then you're completely autonomous in terms of your ability to charge your own vehicle. Subscribe to autonomy. Yeah, you subscribe to all the different services, all the different upgrades that you can get on your Tesla. And the idea is that they're going to make less money on each car sold, but they're going to basically get a monthly annual subscription across the board from you. So they not only sell you the car, but they continue to make money from you. And we saw this kind of rolled out in a soft way with BMW announcing that they were going to charge you a monthly subscription in order to have the chip that's in your heated seats actually heat the seats, uh, which I think is pretty diabolical, honestly. But I think Tesla's makes a little more sense because you do need you know, the thing to charge the car. You do need ability to have access to the supercharger network, which Mo found out if you're renting one, you don't get access and you could potentially have to have your Tesla rental uh, towed because uh, they won't let you charge there. Uh, everyone out there, if you buy a Tesla, please buy a charger for your house as well. Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting move. I, I don't know how that looks for them in the short term. If it actually is well executed, I think it could mean they could t- make a ton of money in the future. Uh, and I kind of, it's almost like uh, other other headline companies we talked about recently, like WWE back in 2013 announced they were going to do the WWE Network, where you instead of having all the pay per views, you paid nine ninety month nine a month to be uh, you know have access to the pay per views through WWE. And the stock went from forty to ten, you know, but it has been on a rocket ship ever since, and is now being sold to Endeavor for over a hundred dollars a share uh, because they built in you know, that, that subscription model, they get bought by, or they license it on Peacock, all that money still flows through the WWE. It's a valuable live product. Uh, so I kind of view this as, as similar. The question is, can they execute on the back end? Can they continue? Can they execute this plan and have it actually work out in a way that creates meaningful value uh, in the short term? It doesn't look so great in the long term. I guess it remains to be seen. I mean, it kind of goes back to, um, I would say one distinction between Tesla and Apple is that you buy an Apple product, you don't need to subscribe to iOS to actually have it work. Correct. Um, They have these services that add value that you can purchase in addition, um, but you don't have to do that. And and so... I mean, you don't have to have the autonomous package on your Tesla either. You know, it's one of those things, but you know, you don't have to have AirPods. You can use any earphones, but, you know, it looks weird. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 curious to see what what happens with this. I th- for me, for my personal view on Tesla is that um it was an operational story. It was this is a company with um who has a low number of uh SKUs, has what, four products, yeah, um, has massive scale and has the newest factories that are purpose built for this like from any operations management class that should yield higher profitability that's why iphones generate 55 percent gross margin um, because you're producing one product at massive scale and what they're showing with these price decreases and these gross margin decreases is that doesn't really matter as much anymore and so they're trying to lead on price but now their price is more comparable to the rest of the industry. I don't think um, that infrastructure, that operational advantage is where it should be, frankly. And for that reason, um, and then, you know, they're they're talking about coming out with new vehicles, but that's just going to create more SKUs and just further deteriorate that margin profile. And so for, for me, the big bull case was, this is a company that's really it's devoid of all those legacy issues, these different platforms. They have a few, they're going big and they have pricing power and they create a lot of value, which they collect in terms of margin. That's going away. Will they get some of this other subscription stuff? Maybe, 
but that's a much riskier proposition as an investor. And there's going to be a much higher required return on capital for that. So I think Tesla is going to be, if they don't figure out this, uh, these deliveries and get this revenue and get this free cash flow in order, I think they're going to be in trouble. I think yeah. they're going to have significant inventory issues if they don't. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it seems like they're producing vehicles at an unbelievable rate. The problem is there's nobody on the other side buying them. And I think a little bit of that, too, is the wealth effect of what we've seen. You know, when when the market's up 20 percent, 30 percent every year, you know, in 2018, 2019, 2020, you know, it, you feel like you got a lot of walking around money. You can go out and be like, hey, I'm going to take a swing. I'm going to get a Tesla. I'm going to invest in having a charger in my home. You know, when things feel tight, when suddenly the economy starts to slow, you're a little worried. You see other people getting laid off. You see your house price come down a little bit, and interest rates rise. You know, you're not so ready to make that leap, I think. And that's a that's a that's more of a macro problem, I think, than they anticipated either. I mean, you know, I, you know, I don't know this for sure. Maybe because of inflation in 20 years, this will happen. But I don't see myself buying a car that's $90,000 ever, you know. And there are a lot of people like me out there. Uh, and there's even more people like that when times are tough. So I think that that's really hurting them. Uh, you know, they basically have the Chipotle model versus the McDonald's model when they came out, right? Because like, yeah. there's only seven or eight ingredients at Chipotle and you can have 25,000 versions of a lunch, you know, versus McDonald's, which has 3,000 SKUs, uh, you know, 15, 20 different types of sandwiches. Uh, and that's where GM, you know, and everybody else is. They, they try and launch a new sandwich. You've got to compete with all the other sandwiches you've got. Tesla's not that way, but the problem is their sandwiches cost $55 a piece, Uh you know, and you've got to get your own spe special sandwich box. Uh, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm getting hungry yeah. now, man. Yeah. It's like, if that's a $55 sandwich, that better be a yeah. good sandwich. Which just seems like a pain, you know, especially when it's like, hey, with the price cuts. Yeah. I could take this excess capital and invest it for four months and get an annualized return of 520. Or, you know, I could, I could put it into an electric vehicle, you know, that may or may not benefit me in the short term. So I think, I think people are making choices and I think this is one of them. Okay. That's uh, a great point. And on, on that note, uh, we'll choose to end it there. Um, we will be back tomorrow. Uh, we have Regions Financial. We have HCA, Schlumberger. Uh, so a couple, couple of interesting reports. SLB. They changed their name. Oh, that's right. SLB uh, Oil or whatever they are so, now. Um, we had a former intern whose last name uh, was similar to that, um, but not pronounced that way. Um, he should just go by SLB now. Shout out, shout out to Schlummy. Happy 420, buddy. <laughs> All right. On that note, uh, have a great day. Uh, enjoy the weather if you're here. It's, it looks beautiful outside uh, and we'll see you tomorrow.